You're listening to Medscape's in discussion series on respiratory syncytial virus in adults, a podcast where thought leaders and clinical experts share their diverse insights and practical ideas for optimizing patient care. This series is hosted by Dr. Forrest Arnold. Dr. Arnold is the chief of the University of Louisville Division of Infectious Diseases and director of the Center of Excellence for Research in Infectious Diseases. He also acts as the co-editor-in-chief for the Journal of Respiratory Infections and Program Director for the Clinical Fellowship in Infectious Diseases. Relevant disclosures can be found with the episode show notes on Medscape.com or the Medscape app. The topics and discussions are planned, produced, and reviewed independently of advertisers. This podcast is intended only for U.S. healthcare professionals. Hello, my name is Dr. Forrest Arnold. Welcome to Season 2 of the Medscape In Discussion podcast series on RSV in adults. Today we've asked Dr. Brittany West to join us again to talk about the impact RSV is having on rural communities, specifically looking at where she practices in West Virginia. This episode we will look back at the 23-24 RSV season regarding incidents, rural impact, vaccine use, and promising areas of research as we explore the management and outcomes of RSV infection in adults. First, let me introduce my guest, Dr. Brittany West. Dr. West is a family medicine specialist practicing in Bridgeport, West Virginia. Welcome to the Medscape In Discussion podcast. Thank you for having me. Dr. West, we last spoke nine months ago in episode six of season one. I know I've been busy since then recruiting people interested in infectious diseases, fellowships, and faculty because the demand of our specialty has increased so much since COVID-19, and RSV only adds to that demand. How have you been? We've been well. We actually just matched our resident slots for family med this year as well. We take six here. Um, I'm at the United Hospital Center in Bridgeport, and I agree with you that we definitely need more committed candidates, definitely in the primary care realm as well, due to our, you know, rampant infectious disease issues like COVID, uh, flu, RSV. Well, we had another winter season and since we talked, and it wasn't so bad, or was it on your end? When I look at data from a rural health standpoint, I really care about the morbidity and mortality outcomes of respiratory viruses. It really stinks if you get a cold, quote unquote, like our patients say that they do. But what I care about is who ends up in the ED, who ends up in the hospital, and who ends up succumbing to the virus, right? So in RSV, we know that happens with really little babies and also in our elderly, more immunocompromised adults. I also like to know each season what the split or skew between all the viral pathogens is. In some seasons, like you know, if you come in with a runny nose, I can say this is probably flu. It flu's rampant in my community. This year, that wasn't really true. It was sort of you get a quad test, you get a quad test, everybody gets a quad test sort of approach to testing. And we'll talk about why that is. So this year's season, in comparison to the 2022-2023 season, was a bit different in how the viral positives were dominating nationally. So if you look at the CDC positive tests for viral respiratory illness, the peak occurred around New Year's this year. Our RSV positivity throughout the season was about 10%. Flu was about 18% and COVID was about 13 If you contrast this with last year, our peak last year was around Thanksgiving. So it was about a full month earlier than this year's. Flu was more prevalent last year, about 26%. COVID was about 8 and RSV was about 8 So obviously, if you move backwards in time, COVID-19 was going to dominate for multiple years before that, with flu and RSV not really being quite as prevalent and the peaks occurring sort of all over the place. And like I said, what I really care about in family medicine and rural medicine is not what is dominating, but how sick are people getting and how full is my ED and my hospital going to be? How did that compare to the RSV that you saw last year? This year, the easy answer as to who presented to the ED for the level of care was people that had co-infection. So people that had RSV and flu, RSV and covid those patients tend to be more immunosuppressed or sometimes just unlucky and got hit with both. The co-infection peak this year was similar to last year, and the rate presenting to the ED was about 10% of patients were co-infected. When you looked at like single flu infection or COVID-19, flu was 6%, COVID-19 was 3 and RSV was about 1%, which actually doesn't sound that bad, right? But then we ask ourselves, who gets admitted from the ED who actually needs to be there and needs to come in for stabilization? And the CDC has a really cool tool called RSVNet, and it looks at the hospitalization rate for viral illnesses. Nationally, again, around New Year's, we hit our like hospitalization peak. 
Last year, again, peak was at Thanksgiving. The overall trend over the past five seasons, again, very altered during, due to COVID, the season was more on par this year compared to years at like 2015 to 2018, about when the peak occurred. If you look at pre-COVID years, the season 2018 to 2019, our peak hospitalization rate was only about two for 100,000 in January. And the overall hospitalization was half of what we're seeing now. It's about 25.2 per 100,000. So we're looking at 50 to 60 per 100,000 in the last couple of seasons. It was half of that. And that's pre-vaccinations. That's pre all the things we have now to prevent illness in people. We're still seeing a big jump in that. So the final question becomes who succumbs to these viral illnesses? That's one of the more important things for us to pay attention to, right? So, okay, if you get hospitalized, if you go home, if you don't get to go home from the hospital, that becomes a really big deal. This is where we see the big difference. And I think this is where the public's perception gets confused. You see so many more kids get hospitalized with RSV, but adults are dying from RSV. So our peak death rate this year was the first week of January, highest in the greater than 65 age group. So about 5.56%. In the 2022 season, it was a like 7.8%. In our younger age group, it was somewhere between 3 to 4%, anyone under 64. Deaths attributed to COVID in those greater than 65 also peaked in January this year at about 4%. And that 18 to 64 age group was about 1 to 2%, somewhere in there. And then nationally, the percent of total deaths due to COVID flu, RSV, were the highest, about 1.5% for those over 65. In your area, were patients receiving the vaccine? Yeah, so vaccine uptake for us has been low, and there's lots of factors to that. And you know, we look at any vaccine and studies on vaccine hesitancy overall, you have about 20% of patients, just in general, that are going to be early uptakers of a vaccine or of a recommendation. You have 20%, no matter how much you try to explain why it's important and what you try to drive home the importance of it, they're unlikely to choose to take that vaccine. So that that's 60% in the middle to play with. The CDC has like a reporting platform called RSV Vax View, where they actually report state by state and jurisdiction wise. And I think you can even break it out into area code, how many people have accepted the RSV vaccine. As of a couple of weeks ago, um, which would have been April 13th of 2024, about 23% of adults 60 and older nationally had gotten an RSV vaccine. And about 10% said, I plan to get it in the future. So we're around that 33%. We still have a way to go on um, our potential people that would be willing to get vaccinated. There is a skew about where they're being administered. So as of the end of March this year, there was about 10 million doses given in retail pharmacies and only about 340,000 given in physicians' offices. And that a lot has to do with Medicare, right? And how vaccines are billed under Medicare and a lot of them have to get them at a retail pharmacy. When we break out into the group of pregnant women that are eligible for a vaccine, as of the end of January, the vaccination rate wasn't much better. It was about 17.8%. But when you look at those moms that had had an infant who's under eight months old in the past eight months through RSV season that gave their infant Bay Fortis, 42% stated they had given their child Bay Fortis. And about 23% said, hey, I, I'm willing to do this and I plan on doing it. I'll talk it over at my physician at the next visit. So you can see that like our perspective of who's most impacted by RSV really shows in the vaccination rates. And in my state specifically, so West Virginia is always low in the numbers on most a lot of things for vaccines. About 10% of our adult population has been vaccinated. One of the only states to lag behind me is Mississippi, and it's 5.6%. And then, Dr. Arnold, you know, your state is like 11.6%. So we are neck and neck in Appalachia there. So I think the best thing we can do to fix this is, one, to fix the public view of RSV as a pediatric disease and for physicians as well. The more we can educate each other is good. I know Epic on my side will launch an alert for RSV vaccination and, and elderly adults or people that will qualify. So that's been really helpful so we can have that discussion. One thing that we have started doing in our practice is giving handheld scripts. So if they have to go to the pharmacy because of their insurance, we will print the script for the RSV vaccine and hand it to them. And then it kind of holds as a placeholder in their brain that says, hey, I need to get this vaccine. 
then also it it just confers to them that I think this is important enough that I'm printing this out for you. And I think at the end of the day, the numbers and those mortality risks seem low, right? So 1%, 6% of patients dying due to an illness seems low. It all seems like a number on paper until it's your patient or your neighbor or your family member or your child or your grandchild that's been affected by the complications and morbidity of that disease. And it's all just a number until I have to intubate an otherwise healthy patient who may not make it off that ventilator, or I have to stand at the bedside and have end of life discussions with a family that thought, I didn't think they'd get the six from this. It's just RSV, or it's just flu, or it's just COVID. So I think our job is to educate that the risk is low, but to increase that appraisal of it's high enough for me to get the vaccine. So the lower RSV season this past year must not be attributed to a high vaccination rate because not that many people got vaccinated. And we know that RSV seasons trend up and trend down over time. But in the long run, it would certainly be better for adults to get vaccinated to prevent that big next RSV year, whenever that is. As we move on, are you aware of any key research findings from the past year related to RSV infection in adults? So we have a lot of interesting things on the horizon. When I explain to my patients, when they come in with a running nose and a cough, you know, they're not feeling great, why I quad test them? Try to explain that for flu and for COVID, I have antivirals for that. And, you know, currently we don't have any that are FDA approved for RSV. There are some in the development and one of the ones that I actually think will come to market. Reviral has been working on multiple different antivirals for RSV, for adults and for kids. So the one that I think will probably come to market and looks like it's going to head that way in trials is originally known as RV521. The way that this antiviral will work, it's administered as an oral capsule. So patients tend to tolerate that pretty well. It works on the same candidate as the vaccines. So it's working on that RSV fusion protein to prevent entry. Okay, so it's going to work on the same target that they do. It's been granted fast track designation by the FDA. And in 2021, Reviral had announced that they completed part A of their phase two Reviral 1 study, which was infections in hospitalized infants. They're looking into trials to expand that. I ex- would expect in the next couple of years we're going to see that that comes to market. We actually do have an antiviral both for children and for adults. Um, A lot of the work has been led by uh, DiVincenzo et al. um, And they've tested a lot of different substances. I'm not going to dove into it here, but if you look at, you know, their research, they've tested three, four, five compounds. This one tends to have the lowest side effect profile. One of the other ones that they tested tended to result in a lot of neutropenia and side effects like transaminitis and those sorts of things. This has the cleanest side effect profile. The most common side effects that patients list were like nausea and vomiting, things we attribute to antivirals and, you know, antibiotics anyways, and no one stopped taking the antiviral. Now, the interesting about all these studies is that they were all a viral challenge study. So basically the researching group voluntarily infected volunteers with RSV, with a particular strain of RSV that's been well studied. And then once they became seropositive and started t- testing positive on the RSV testing, they would start giving them the antiviral. The problem with that in real practice is that you and I both know the incubation period for RSV is long, like three to eight days. And they based all these testing protocols off of flu. Well, flu's incubation is so much shorter. In real practice, I don't know what the outcome will be. This was, you know, a virus challenge study. It's not using it in real world situations where someone's been developing a large amount of virus over the last three to eight days, and now we've hit the peak and they're symptomatic. So most of the patients in the study didn't become symptomatic. That would be interesting to see come to market and see if any of the other ones do. The other interesting things are on the more preventative side. And and one reason I think, particularly my pregnant females, because I do OB in my practice, have low uptake is because I am working to do the dim that they get Tdap, COVID, flu, and RSV. That's a lot of vaccines. <laughs> All around the same like 28 to 32 week mark. And I know a couple other companies are looking at mRNA combo vaccines that will combine RSV, flu, and COVID all into one vaccine. Plus minus like CMV, I think was the other one. 
So I would hope that some companies start doing the same so that we can justify two jabs or one jab a season for our 65 and up patients versus now you need COVID, flu, and RSV and boosters. Great. Um, you've mentioned discussing issues with your local university, but uh, with those other family practice physicians around you, do you have collaboration with them? Yeah. The biggest thing for me, because I teach in a residency is, and I say this all the time working in a residency setting, is the better that I train them, the better care they're able to take care of people out in the community. And so my residents will inherit a panel of two to 3,000 patients. They go and rotate with other family docs in the community. So when they're learning new standards of care, like, hey, RSV vaccines are available and they're recommended for this age group. And hey, Bay Fortis is available for infants and they're recommended for, you know, this sort of indication, whatever it might be. They're able to spread that information to, to people in the community. We do a lecture series as well where we, we discuss all those things. But I think when you come from an academic background like we do, if I don't train them to the level of being able to be up to date now and up to date in the next five to 10 years, then I've really failed in my job as an educator. And the best thing that I can educate them to do is to look at guidelines and stay up to date. I actually had a discussion with my residents recently about um, how hard it is to stay up to date on everything that comes out in primary care. And actually, there's some recent studies that show that the average U.S. adult will look at healthcare related information, Google things online, like 156 hours a year. What do you think you and I spend on looking things up? Like as an average practitioner, maybe not in academics like we are, but what do you think the average report was? What value did you get? So <laughs> Doc Simony did a study and they asked a bunch of practicing physicians, how much time per day at your work day do you spend looking up new information? And the average was somewhere between 15 minutes and 30 minutes, which if you go with 30 minutes, average amount is like 120 hours a year. So we're spending less time looking things up than our patients are. Um, and there's also been you know new studies where they've looked at in a primary care doctor's day, so in my day, if I was to stick to all the preventative measures and do all my charting in the same day and provide all the care that I need to give and do my inbox management, is a study out of, um, I think, Mass General and Brigham Women's, that it would take 27 hours a day for us to do that. Um, if we do team-based care, it brings it down to about 10, somewhere in there. Um, so when, when I look at practitioners in the community who are trying to decide, hey, do I recommend this RSV vaccine or not? to patients, you really are looking at that patient assessing their risk, right? So if I have somebody who has COPD and type 2 diabetes, my push on that vaccine is going to be harder than for my healthier adults. And I think that they look at that too, like what's going to give me the most bang for my buck? I have to counsel about these things. And I think in West Virginia in particular, we are a very impoverished state. We're like the fifth lowest median household per capita. It's like $51,000 a year we have one of the highest rates of poverty. It's like 15% somewhere in there. We also have like one of the lower education levels. So when my patients are coming to me and they have an RSV infection, they're waiting until they're really sick to come see me for lots of reasons. One is they can't make it to the, you know, the physician's office due to access. Like they can't drive to the office. They can't afford to miss work. And if I tell them they have to quarantine for the time you have to quarantine for RSV or COVID or flu, they can't afford to. They're already working two jobs to make ends meet, and they already don't have you know enough to make that happen. And then they travel further distances. There's studies by the American Hospital Association that shows that if you're in a rural community, your commute time to your physician's about double. And I will say my personal patient census, and I talked about it on the last episode, my patients travel sometimes an hour, an hour and a half to come see me. And so if they think they just have a cold, they may or may not make the drive to see me. Then you look at like how many patients we have that are uninsured. Our national rate's 8%. I know in West Virginia, 36% of our population is like low income. 28% are Medicaid patients. And then we have this uninsured population that they may or may not get that vaccination covered for them. They may not get the testing covered. So there's a lot of things that go into persuading a patient population to invest in their health. And I think from a primary care standpoint, especially with our patients, we are able to advocate for them because we know them. We invest in their communities. We're on their community boards with them. We are, you know, volunteering at the churches with them. We are coaching the kids' little league teams. So we've invested in the community. 
We develop these long relationships with our patients where they see the same doctor for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And that relationship with them, when I make a recommendation, even it's something they don't agree with, maybe they they are a little vaccine hesitant. And I say, hey, you know, you have COPD and you have, you know, this other immunosuppressive condition. You're on Humira for your psoriasis, whatever it might be. You should really consider getting the RSV vaccine. Even if they don't say yes that day, they know that we're making that recommendation out of caring for them. And I think that's where rural medicine and suburban and more urban medicine differs, that we're really invested in our communities and those patients care that we're invested in them. And that seems really authentic to them. Today, we've talked to Dr. Brittany West about several key aspects of RSV in adults. The first RSV was lower this past year than the previous year. Overall, there was not a predominant viral infection. It was a mixture of flu and COVID and RSV. Co-infections did still occur. In general, more children get infected with RSV, but adults die from RSV. That's an exaggerated statement, but it makes a point that RSV is not just a children's disease. The vaccination rates continue to be low, but with a new vaccine, we hope certainly that they um, pick up and trials are underway for anti-RSV treatments in adults. We want to encourage healthcare providers to stay informed about the latest development in the field. Thank you for tuning in. Please take a moment to download the Medscape app to listen and subscribe to this podcast series on RSV and adults. This is Dr. Forrest Arnold for the Medscape In Discussion podcast. Thanks for listening to Medscape's In Discussion Respiratory Syncytial Virus in Adults podcast series with our host, Dr. Forrest Arnold. Be sure to look for more In Discussion episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Medscape.com or the Medscape app for show notes links, and more information on respiratory syncytial virus in adults.